Since 1976, nearly 1,500 Americans have been executed in the name of justice. But today's guest cautions about the human cost of the death penalty and the innocent victims wrongfully put to death. She's Sister Helen Prejean this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by Sister Helen Prejean, a religious sister of the Congregation of St. Joseph and a fierce opponent of the death penalty. Her books Dead Man Walking and The Death of Innocence expose the cost of the death penalty in a way that facts and figures never will. Sister, thank you so much for being with Glad us. Glad to be here. You're, you're in town because yesterday you received an honorary degree from Salve Regina University. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yes, congratulations. You have been a, uh, 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 an opponent of the death penalty publicly uh, for more than 30 years now. Uh, you've published the two books that I mentioned. Uh, Dead Man Walking, of course, became a critically acclaimed film, an opera, a play. Um, we want to talk about all of those examples of storytelling in public life. But let's start with you, and how did you come to be an opponent of the death penalty? Not always, you know. The traditional Catholic teaching, you know, was that the state had the right to take life, always to protect society. You know, because, you know, you go back in the days, 1,600 years, you didn't have prisons. And so I never thought about it. In fact, you know, when I was writing, when I was going to high school, they had a portable electric chair that would come to Baton Rouge uh, to kill people who had done a crime in Baton Rouge. It moved around the state to bring the lesson home. Don't do crime here. And I was oblivious of it. I was in my little cocoon in my little world. This was the teaching, and so I just believed it. So, in fact, this memoir that I just am writing, it'll be coming out called River Fire, is about the awakening gradually, and it's connected to the gospel of Jesus, that I wasn't connected to people in the margins of people in poverty or any that would give rise to violence, and so I was unaware of things. So that awakening that's in the story of River of Fire is the story of how I came to write Dead Man Walking or how I came to go into the St. Thomas housing projects in New Orleans and got an invitation to write a man on death row, which I did, thinking that I would just be writing letters and he ends up being executed. And that's what threw me into the fire. I watched his death. His name was Patrick Sonier and he was electrocuted to death. And that's the prelude in River of Fire. They killed a man with fire one night. Mm. How many, uh, how many executions have you seen now? Six. Six. How does that change you? First of all, it gives you a sense of perspective that I'm only going to spend my life working on stuff of life and death and things that matter. And also to break through the secrecy. See, the death penalty when it's carried out is a secret ritual. There have been at least two court cases where they've tried to make the death penalty public and they've been blocked. I got in as one of those witnesses to just see what it really means for state governments to take a live human being and take them and kill them. All the rhetoric that goes with it, the legalities that go with it about why it's okay to do this. And when you witness something directly and you see all that's involved in it, and you got to be a witness, morally, for me. And so it has given me a sense in my life, I'm not going to any meetings that are not about things that are, that are important. Keep, keep my eye, you know, on the prize of, of justice and making my life matter. So write a book about it. Get out on the road and talk to the public about it. It's what I love about your show, Out in the Public Square. Mm. After I came out of that first execution of Patrick Sonier, 
middle of the night outside the gates of Angola prison, uh, threw up. I'd never witnessed a human being deliberately being killed in front of my eyes. Uh, and then I thought, the people are never going to see this. I got to do something. I didn't know what I'd do. I didn't know I'd write a book. But in Louisiana, you talk. I mean, we talkers, and we have a lot of oral tradition, you know. So I just got out on the road and just started talking to people. Then I wrote the book, came after. So the death penalty obviously affects a whole lot of people, people who observe family members and, and the person who is condemned. And I think we want to go through a few of those people. How fundamentally or, or first does it affect the condemned, the people who are on death row awaiting yeah, sure. death by the well, state? Well, of course, they are the ones being killed. And the reason I think one day, morally, as we evolve as a society, we'll see it as torture, is because when you sentence a conscious, imaginative person to death, you can't help but anticipate. Every person I've been with on death row had the same nightmare. They're coming to get me. It's my time. They're dragging me out of my cell. I'm going, no, no. And then I wake up. And it was, it was just a dream. But they are going to come for me. And, and then watching as the others are taken to be killed. Joseph O'Dell, who's in my second book, The Death of Innocence, he watched as 22 people were executed ahead of him, some of them who had come to be his good friends. And so from the point of view of the one being executed, of course, that's the one it happens to. But they have mamas and daddies and siblings and little nephews who are going to go through that with them. And, uh, and I describe those scenes in Death of Innocence of like with Dobie Williams, with all of them sitting right outside the execution chamber, having their last visit and their last goodbye, and not knowing what to say, silence, uh, and then how much I love you, and then they take them away. And I've watched mothers say goodbye to their sons. They weren't allowed to hug them or touch them. And just leaning over the hood of the prison vehicle that's going to take them away and just sobbing. And, uh, and I remember and just, I could see the mother. This got into the film at Devon Walk. And, and he said to me, how's my mama? And I'm watching her collapsed over the hood of the car and I'm just going, she's fine. Your mom's fine. I know that's what she would want to say to him. It's unbelievable agony. And then on the other side, which we need to talk about, the victim's family. Because mm -hmm. what is this going to do for them? What's the rhetoric of it? What are they told? Well, what actually happens to the victims' families is the other side of the story. What about the executioners? I watched Dead Man Walking again just before, a couple of days ago. Uh, and, you and did I, your homework before you met the nun. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know about your life. I, I, know. I spent eight years in parochial school, so I always <laughs> did my homework before I met the nuns. All right. Uh, but I was struck by the... the people who actually execute, whether yeah. directly, whether they do the lethal injection, whether they insert the catheter, right. whatever. And, and it was, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, they, they seem detached, and yet they're people. How could they talk about that? No, no, What's you know what? And they're, they're a rising group of people who've been speaking out about their experiences, and it's one of the reasons why the death penalty is on its way out. So I'll just take one example, Ron McAndrews. Uh, he was the warden in Florida, and he said, I took that job as the warden of that prison as honorable, an honorable profession, to run a good prison, help people, you know, get a hold of their lives, become citizens, and he had to preside at two executions, just two. And of course, the warden is the first trigger of the execution, because the executioner is behind a one-way glass, and the warden is the one who in Texas, they take off their glasses. In many states, they just nod their head to set the whole process in motion. And he talks, he gives talks publicly, and he says, I'll be in therapy the rest of my life. It's the premeditated killing of a person who's been rendered defenseless. And then you're part of that process. So even prisoners of war, the Geneva Conventions, you don't tie a prisoner of war's hands and take them out and shoot them because they're defenseless. And so it's essentially the killing of someone rendered defenseless, and it gets to them. I tell the story in Dead Man Walking of one of the 
he was a supervisor on death row, and then they moved him to the execution squad. And after five executions, he just said, I, I can't do it. I got to quit. I come home. I just get in my laser board chair. I can't sleep. I can't eat because I help kill a human being who is defenseless. And so, and that's raising the moral question to us as a society. Granted, we need to be kept safe from people who are violent. But in a way, when you look at the act, it's, in essence, it's imitating the worst behavior of human beings. You kill, so we're going to kill you, but it's going to be the most premeditated, step-by-step -step protocol of death you can imagine. And we're going to strap you down and kill you. Does, does, so I want to uh, explore the societal cost of it a little bit more, because there's an there's a, there's a, there's a economic burden. Uh, but there's a moral burden that comes with uh, 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 states that have the death penalty. Can you, can you speak sure. to that a little bit? Sure. And the first thing to say is the economic cost is part of the moral right. burden. Because if you're using millions of dollars, and they've done study after study of this, it's at least double, or sometimes, like in California, six times the amount of cost to kill a human being with the death penalty than to have them have a life sentence. That's when you add in the appeals and the legal costs and, and all right. of that. And, and a lot of the cost is up front because a lot of people don't realize that when you're going to go for the death penalty, you have to have two trials, two essentially. One is to find the person guilty or, or, or not or to acquit them. But then if they are found guilty, then you have another trial where you can bring in all the mitigating circumstances of a person's life. So when you have decent defense, they're going to talk about their childhood. They're going to talk about how they were beaten when they were, you know, two years old. All the things that could affect a human being, which individualizes a person. It's why it could never work, because the Supreme Court set a criteria that it wasn't going to be for every murder, but only the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. Well, who knows what that means? Right. You kill my mama, that's the worst of the worst. So, so we had a criteria that was going to be unworkable. And then as we, the experience of the death penalty, the cost, the moral cost, we just see a clear pattern that the way it's been applied, the profile is it's poor people executed and almost always eight out of 10 because they kill white people. When people of color are killed in this country, the death penalty seldom sought, unless that black person happens to be a policeman or maybe a whole family. So your inherent biases just come out in the application, even though you got this criteria, worse than the worst. And the other thing that shows clearly is seven out of every 10 is in the 10 southern states that practice slavery are the real practitioners of the death penalty. And interesting, in Louisiana now, we haven't had an execution since 99, because we were doing, we had the fastest rate of executions in the 80s. I think it's just because the warden the guards, what you pointed out, Wayne, just it's too hard on them. But your work has been a, a significant factor, too, in, in this tide turning, if you'll pardon a bad metaphor. Yeah, no, of course. Because what, look, my 30 years of experience, I've been in every state, I've been in every major city, crisscrossing to speak to groups, you know, universities, civic groups, churches, synagogues. And you go to talk to the people, and you, one of the things you realize is the people say they're for the death penalty, and, and everybody will give their little, you know, scenario. Well, I'm for the killing of policemen, or I'm for the killing of children, or they got their own little designer death penalty, and they have no idea how it really works. And you take them through it, and you got to take them through. I had a really good editor for Dead Man Walking who helped me shape that story. You never would have heard of this book. All right, I'd never written a book before. Had Jason Epstein at Random House. And when he got the first draft of Dead Man Walking, he said, you wait far too long to talk about the crime and what this person did. You sold for the human rights of this man to be executed. But what did he do? And he and his brother had in cold blood killed two teenage kids. He said, if you don't have that in the first 10 pages, nobody's going to read your book. And he helped me. And he said, then you, got, you stand there in the outrage of that, it, and your reader can feel it with you, that this is outrageous that these young people were killed like this. And to get inside the victim's family, and what would it be to be the mother or the father that has lost her child? And you got to be there. 
and then you gradually take your reader with you over now. Now, what does it mean for the state to execute the person who did that terrible crime? And does it help victims' families? So I tell stories of victims' families, like the Harveys in Louisiana. Not only were they there for the execution of the, of the man, they were allowed to sit in the front seat. Louisiana was the first one to allow victims' families to witness the execution. And they come out afterwards, they've waited, like, I don't know how many years for this moment. And Mr. Harvey, the stepfather of the young girl who was killed, he's asked, well, how do you feel now? You got to watch Robert Willie die. How do you feel now? And he said, anybody got any whiskey? Anybody want to dance? We got Robert Willie. And then he said, do you know what? He died too quick. I hope he burns in hell. And he put his thumb down like this. And I realized he was like a thirsty man. He had just had a long drink of salt water. He and his wife would come back to every execution. They couldn't get out of it. You couldn't kill him enough. You couldn't. It, it was just like, what does it really do for victims' families? And just one more little point on this before we go somewhere else. But when New Jersey did away with the death penalty about 10 years ago, 62 murder victims' families testified saying, don't kill for us. The death penalty just re-victimizes us. We wait for this justice that's supposed to happen. They wait 10 years, 15 years. And then they just say, it's, there's no closure. There's, there's no healing. There, there's, and it's all public. Yeah. You know, the oh. media at that door, how do you feel he got another stay of execution? You can't, how do you move on? So you, you published Dead Man Walking in 1993. It's a major motion picture by 1996. I'd like to hear a little bit about that process, but I'm also interested, though, from 1998 to 2018, there's been a dramatic decrease right. in the death penalty in the United States. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, not, not to suggest any immodesty, but do you draw a, a line from your work and the, the popularity of, of the work that you've produced to this change in the actual application yeah, of the law? I'm part of it, sure. Like when a wave hits a shore, you don't single out one drop. I'm a drop in there, okay? But you have in every state these great groups that have been working, these coalitions to abolish the death penalty. And it's all about educating the citizens. Everybody's doing this work in terms of that. You know, I know really tremendous lawyers that have taken this case, and they get out and they testify. Do you know how the trial works if you're poor and you got a court-appointed lawyer over against somebody who could get a, you know, a crackerjack of a lawyer? And then another factor is we've had over now 151 wrongfully convicted people. We are making mistakes all over the place, mm -hmm. and the public is also getting that information. That's why I did the second book, The Death of Innocence, how you can make a mistake. And all of this, I think, has been a factor. And, and the experience of people who have had to do the executions, their witness, victims' families saying, doesn't help, all of this is playing a part in the cost. The cost, the cost, the cost, because when a state can go bankrupt in the criminal justice office trying to do one death penalty. And, and I think another piece more recently, and, and maybe not the, not the biggest piece, but, but a piece recently, companies that make the drug for lethal injection have refused to sell for this purpose. How did they come to that consciousness raising? They did, though. I mean, this has happened. No, right. It's hugely complicated. And, you know, I put the, the rest uh, of, I mean, the responsibility for this in the lap of the Supreme Court, because they are allowing states right now to experiment to kill people. Mm -hmm. Like the latest thing in Oklahoma, they want to use some kind of nitrogen gas. They are allowing them to experiment. Can you imagine? being strapped down and knowing that they're going to kill you with something. I mean, this is really close to, I mean, other atrocities where we experimented in the killing of people. It's, but the drug company is an interesting story because somewhere in the 90s, late 90s, we sent a letter. Uh, they penned it under my name, but a lot of people were part of this, to the drug company in Europe saying, did you know? that your drugs, which are, you know, to help people through surgery, are being used to execute people. They didn't know it. And when they found out, then they issued this thing of our drug is not to be used. So then it, 
it got to be how do you get the drugs? Mm -hmm. And so it's sneaking the drugs. You know, Texas, we don't know how Texas gets their drugs, who they get it from. Uh, and so all kind of exposures on that of what's going right. in there to try to get the drugs because drug companies don't want to, their drugs to be used to be kill people. What you're saying is morally appalling to me, experimenting with how you kill someone. Yeah. No, I know. The, the argument is sometimes raised, and I think less so now than certainly before you began your work, that the death penalty is a deterrent to crime. I mean, you still hear that. Yeah, well, and How do you that comes out of people's ignorance. They'll say that. Well, it's a deterrent. I think when Pataki ran for governor of New York and yeah. he reintroduced the death penalty, I was listening to him in the car, in the car radio, and he's saying it's a deterrent. All you got to do is look at the states that practice the death penalty and those that don't, and look at the crime rate. And just look at it, the violent rate, the murder rate. Texas, that has had the most death penalties of anybody, you look at the murder rate in Texas and compare it with states like Michigan that have never had it. You know, just, uh, it's a simple thing. You don't have to look long. I, I put about that in, in Dead Man Walking, too. And here's the thing. Most people that commit murder don't know when they wake up in the morning they're gonna murder somebody. Few murders are premeditated things where they're gonna go and kill somebody. It happens in a moment, there's no premeditation, and not thinking of consequences. They're not thinking, well, if I do this, you no, know, well, I'm and then be on this death might row, happen. Or let me see, well, it'd be a life sentence or the death, uh, you know, yeah. as if. You're not thinking, and, uh, and that's why it can never be a deterrent. Policemen say this. Talk to us a little bit about, so you, you wrote the book after, after witnessing uh, Patrick Sonier's uh, execution. Um, talk to us though about the process that turned it from a book into a feature film. Well, I call this providence of God. I mean, Susan Sarandon. Uh, the hardback had come out in 93. It came out in paperback. A friend of hers, Arlene, gave her the book while she was filming The Client in Memphis. She's in a little trailer. And she reads Dead Man Walking. She calls me up. She saw we needed another kind of film in the United States. I mean, because they were formulaic. It was all about if the person's guilty ends with the execution, justice is done. She called me up. We met at a restaurant in New Orleans. Kind of funny little scene. I didn't know what she looked like. I rented Thelma and Louise, got her mixed up with Gina Davis. Look, <laughs> she comes to the restaurant. I go, Thank you, Jesus. She's Louise, because I like Louise. I mean, it's Gina, you know, anyway. And, uh, and she made that movie happen because she said, We need a film. Your book brings people over to both sides. And I know who should do this film, Tim Robbins. And so it took her nine months, though, because he was working on other projects. Finally, probably for domestic tranquility, because <laughs> she'd say, did you read the nun's book? No, I didn't read the book. Did you read the book? I didn't read the book. He read the book. And, and he said, and that made me feel good as a, as a writer. It, it was the easiest screenplay he had ever written because I brought people over to both sides from all the angles. And so, so then uh, we're going to do a film on the death penalty when support is at 80% in the United States, right? And I said, Tim, how are we going to get people to look at our film? I mean, I, I work collaboratively with every line and every scene in that movie. It, it, it couldn't be better than that. And he said, well, we're banking on some nominations for the Academy Awards. I said, really? Isn't that kind of a long shot? He goes, Sister Helen, the whole movie is a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> and we got four nominations, and Susan got the Academy Award, and that sealed it. It just brought the movie. It brought to people. Well, it, it, and I think the success of that movie, the, the Oscars, were also a factor in, in bringing knowledge to people who did not know Absolutely. what the death penalty was. You know, and one of the last lines on it, Wayne, is Tim has across the, the screen, read Dead Man Walking. And we had a little saying, the movie plows the ground and the book tills the soil. Because if you could get people reading because read, when you, as you know, you're an author. You write books. When people are reading, they're quiet. It's like you're on retreat. You're not debating. 
and you're using your imagination, you can go to deep places. Can you give me some of that Providence that got your book made into a book? <laughs> I'm not in <laughs> control of Providence. That's the nature Providence. We got about 30 seconds left. Why tell a story rather than engaging in a big fact-laden debate? Because you gotta have people who imaginatively engage. They come in, at least feel ambivalent. I think I'm for this or I'm for this in these circumstances. And you gotta take them with you on a journey imaginatively. And you also give facts and information and only a story can do that. And a story just brings you there and leaves it up to the listener or to the reader. Put it in your lap now, what do you think? And the theater manager said at the end of the film, everybody just stayed seated and filed out quietly because they were thinking. And that's what we do as authors, it's what we do in art. We bring people into a situation they otherwise would never go and then leave it to them, trust them that they're gonna work it out. But you brought them there truthfully. Sister Helen Prejean, it's a remarkable body of work. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. That's all the time we have this week, but if you wanna know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can also catch previous episodes. For Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis. We hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.